you are. Just hang on, Paul. Yeah, sorry, I was in safari. The music's playing. I think Cam's going to be joining us. That's great. Uh, but I don't know where he is. Let me do one thing here. Obviously, you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. And we are live. Oh, yay. I guess I should have mentioned that right away before he said something. <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're looking at two Canadian Mennonite boys. Do you still call yourself a Mennonite? Of course. I think I think it has a cultural aspect to it as much as the belief. It's kind of like you can be a secular Jew. Yeah. Kind of a secular Mennonite. Yeah. Uh, so Paul and I have a very similar background, I believe. We both uh, love Crokinole, which nobody here knows what that is. In fact... Um, you wasted like half an hour of my life on that. Only half an hour? That's it? Well, then I... I kept it on a lot of the day. Yeah. <laughs> Paul messaged me last night, said, Hey, Doug, uh, by the way, I'm uh, debating Mike Winger <laughs> tomorrow night. And so we talked about that for a little bit. And then I mentioned Crokinole and showed him a, a YouTube um, channel. And oh, that might have hurt cut into some of your uh, research it, time. Uh, it, it skewed the performance. Mike sent you to do that, probably. <laughs> How'd you feel tonight? I felt good. Um, the The format, um, you know, with the discussion, it was hard to know. It was so open ended. It was hard to know for me when to interrupt, when not to, because you know, I didn't know if I'm getting my time back, and I kind of wanted to um, not go too far off. I didn't want to get into a situation where we're like three points deep and we have to cycle back. I kind of wanted to deal with each one. Um, so I don't know if I came across as aggressive more than I maybe meant oh, to. I don't think you did. But good. No, I, I think uh, it was a very civil, cordial type discussion. I wouldn't even call it a debate, really. No, it was not. It was intended to be a discussion, although it was weird that there was opening statements. But um, he's an I, I like him. He's a very likable person. Um, in a way, it was. I didn't want to be so condescending as to say, hey, I've been where you are, and I think that you're just a few years behind us on you know, coming to some realizations, because it feels like maybe he might be. Um, well, uh, it's really tough, because uh, I don't know if we should talk about this already or wait for camp. Well, let's talk about it now. Um, okay. like, at, like At the very end, in the Q&A section, like mm -hmm. I, I sent three questions to either Steve or Kyle. Who gets those questions, Steve or Kyle or both? I uh, believe Steve gets them, yeah. Okay, and I, I kind of figured so because when I asked the three questions, I can see, I kind of saw a little smirk in Steve's face. <laughs> like, yeah, this is a question that I think every Christian does not want to be asked. And, and that is, is there any claim in the New Testament that you think probably is false? And if the Christian says, no, I just believe all of it, then what are we talking about here? You know, really, what is this all about? It, just read the part where it says Jesus is God, rose from the dead, and you're done. Right? Exactly. <laughs> and Yeah, the minimal fact makes sense if you think it's inerrant. Yeah, if you just think every claim is true, then, um, then really there's nothing to discuss. Like if, if, so Christians, if you're listening to this, would you want us atheists, us dirty atheists, to at least consider that a claim might be true? I think you would say, yeah, of course, Doug, of course, Paul, I want you guys to consider that these claims are true. Well, on the same token, would you do, take that same advice for yourself and, and at least consider the possibility that these claims are not true or probably not true? And like comments like that really shakes the believer because they think, yes, that's reasonable. If I'm expecting that from you, Paul, I should expect that of myself. Now they can go on and say, well, yeah, I, but I have done my research and, and I've come to the conclusion that this is true. That's all good and fine. But if you're at least not open to the idea that, um, that you haven't read everything or that 
maybe your conclusion's false for the same reason you might think Paul's conclusion or my conclusion's false. Like we're human beings, right? We all have proclivities and biases and and we're prone to errors and so the super fair question you asked was, you know, what are some of the reasons that your position might be wrong? Like, what are some of the best positions? And I feel like it doesn't matter whether you think it's a, a political candidate or the wallpaper you've chosen or the hardwood floor. You've, like, almost anything, unless you know the best reasons you might be wrong, you probably haven't fully explored that you're right. Hey, Cam, welcome. I hear, is your dog playing with a chew toy? Yeah, I'm going to get rid of that. Oh, is that? Oh, that's Paul. I thought that was Cam. Um, no, it was but and Mike, I, I I'm very confident Mike's going to be watching this later, if not right now. But Mike, I think that question is very reasonable. The questions I asked about uh, is there any claim that you think is probably false? Is there any reason to think that the Gospels may not be reliable? Uh, what would change your mind, and so forth? Um, and for you to just immediately say, "Oh yeah, this is Doug. This must come from Doug or Cam, and it's just a psychological game." Like that, I don't know. I, I felt a little perturbed from that. <laughs> How about you, Cam? So I think he said psychological questions. Um, and I think he said that, like, your questions are aimed at uh, more his audience as opposed to him himself. Um, but I thought the way that he dealt with that was actually really good. I. I gave him a lot of props for that, like quick, like it was almost like this judo move. Like it almost like, it almost like dismissed the the question in this way that was um, like justifiable without yeah, like, dodging. Oh yeah. That's just Doug. And he uses these psychological things. So yeah, we don't, have to, <laughs> yeah. we don't have to worry about that question. Yeah. That's what it felt like to me, <laughs> but I gave him props for that because it was quite uh, quick on his feet. Okay. But let's get, Let's get to the meat. Like, there's so many things that claims that were asserted and things that were said. Was there anything that stood out to you, Paul, that um, that you wanted to dive in deeper with, or that you maybe thought you didn't explain well, or is there anything from that that um, stuck out? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing that stuck out for me was that he obviously watched some of my videos and saw that I had already addressed a lot of his. If you've watched a lot of Mike's videos, he has this alive acronym for his basic uh, points. And he, I'd, I'd messaged Kyle to tell Mike that I was not going to be taking a mythicist position, even though I feel like I could if I wanted to. Um, and I wasn't going to deny that Jesus died because I feel like that's a huge waste of time arguing whether someone in history died. Um, so he got that in advance. But then he has all those other things like the tomb which he totally softened. I can't believe that he caved on the tomb. Um, yeah, because Cam, Cam and I did a critique video on it, and that tomb part was still in there at that point. So this is a recent development. I think he's realized. It's a recent development. Uh, and he, he obviously had gone through my videos where I went through each of the 12 apostles. And like, how do we know what happened to them? And he had at least acknowledged that I knew something about, you know, the fate of the 12. Although he didn't seem to catch on that we don't know that even one of those people preached to anybody ever. It's just, you know, asserted that they did. Um, so I was, I was very surprised that he, he softened there. And then you did um, good though. You did good, uh, Paul, when you asked the question, like, do we have any evidence that they had uh, opportunities to recant? Right. And he, he conceded right. that That's basically no, it's, we, but it's a good inference. Yeah, because it's the other thing they always say is like, if if you if you were the Romans and you just hated those twelve apostles, uh, of course you're going to kill them, whether or not. Well, I mean, it, it seems like a possible outcome that you're just going to kill them and not even give them a chance to recant. Because what good is that? You, you're the Romans. They, I mean, crucifixion. They were crucifying five hundred people a day. Um, presumably just if you were in slight defiance of the king. So it's not like they have these long trials where we're going to do that stuff. Anyway, yeah, that, that assertion by Christians, that was one of the things that shook me when I was a Christian, was like that thing that I believed that they all were martyrs. Um, I have no basis for that. Um, so I find that argument particularly abrasive 
to my current sensibilities, I guess. Cam, do, is there any basis for the martyrdom? And... Um, I mean, there's the account in Acts of Stephen, and there are like non-canonical accounts. So well, I think there might be something about James, but there are non-canonical accounts. But uh, at least when I read the book, uh, the myth of persecution. Um, by Candida Moss, how early Christians invented a story of martyrdom. At least when I first read that, I was pretty convinced that the claims that Christian apologists make about uh, martyrdom in the first and second century are well overblown. The other thing that I wish that I got to, or that if there had been time, my next thing would have been the whole idea of... Um, the most logical thing that we know happened was that crucifixion um, victims, or if you call them victims, people who are crucified were typically buried in mass graves. We know that from lots of historical sources, including, you know, we talked about Josephus, who speaks of exceptions to this rule. So therefore, we know it's the rule. Um, Jesus being put into a mass grave after he died also explains, even if they've gone to the six potential facts of, you know, they couldn't produce a body to refute it and that kind of thing. If they threw Jesus into a mass grave, which was what happened to 90% of them, um, obviously they can't go back and dig him out to show, hey, here's Jesus' body to refute, you know, these these claims because they just wouldn't have known where it was. Um, and this whole Joseph of Arimathea, whom I believe was a creation of the, the gospel writers or and or maybe it was oral tradition tradition before that um it's just not necessary it's this extra layer of like if you're going with Occam's razor on these things we don't need that um we we don't need to try and say talk about why the tomb was empty or why the grave was empty yeah, because well, with uh, go ahead. with joseph joseph of arimathea like my strategy and uh, uh, my uh tactic to lead people to hell is to um <laughs> I say that because that's what Christians are thinking anyhow. So <clears throat> might as well get the elephant, you know, in, in the room, out of the room. I don't know. Um, is to, I would have asked Mike, as soon as I heard, would hear the, the term or the name Joseph of Arimathea, I would ask him, do we have any reason to doubt that this person existed? Like, can you, like, let's just assume he did, but do we have any reasons to question whether he did? And, and have Mike basically take the other position for at least five or 10 seconds, f for many reasons. Number one, for, so his followers, his Christian followers listening, can hear out of his own lips why some people, not him of course, but why some people may doubt this and say, oh, maybe this didn't happen. And, and, and number well, two, to see if he even knows what it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm not trying to be mean to, to Mike, but I would, um, be i find it unlikely he'd be able to articulate the reasons why um certain um critical historians don't think that joseph arimathea existed but um yeah it would be a good question to ask him uh, i think um you did quite well but perhaps didn't emphasize enough paul the methodological issues at play um i i think you did i think you did cover well, but it almost like bears repeating and repeating and repeating again. So his position is that um, he's providing an argument to the best explanation. He's saying that, okay, I've got these certain account, uh, these certain facts that are established. Some of them may be disputed, but what I'm trying to say is that the resurrection claim is the best um, account of these facts. And you're trying to say, um, okay, well, you know, I'm going to dispute some of these facts, but also I want to point out to you um, that uh, this is an extraordinary claim. It's a miraculous claim. Um, and the, the, the explanation that you're giving for is um, an un improbable explanation. What, what I think, um, it's almost like a stalemate in the entire debate. And perhaps even makes it pointless to go into the evidence is that Mike thinks that even if he were able to show that these facts were true, that it would imply that we should believe in the resurrection. 
whereas at least I, and I don't want to speak for you, but at least I think that um, the the type of claim that a resurrection is, is, is so improbable according to what we know about how the world works, that it's it's just the type of evidence he's trying to present is just not good evidence um and it, it doesn't it doesn't actually imply that we should believe it wait a minute and wait a minute cam a, cam are you saying that even if it were true that jesus died of cru- crucifixion and even if it were true that the tomb was found empty even though he didn't use the tomb as a as a minimal fact uh and that um people's lives were changed and that they th- they believed that they saw something even if all those claims are true you still wouldn't believe in the resurrection no, because I think that it's such an improbable claim, but yet this type of evidence is the same type of evidence that we have um, in other cases, yet we don't believe them. And these are cases where um, where the claim is not even as fantastic as what a resurrection claim is. Um, there's just so many ways that humans can be mistaken and these types of texts can come to exist. From the ancient world, we have so many claims of humans being sons of God, humans being miraculously born, uh, humans being uh, having ascended to heaven, uh, humans uh, being resurrected. Uh, we even have claims like that in the Old Testament. And the, the idea here is that using some kind of philosophical method or historical method, we rationally should conclude on the basis of a text alone that these claims are probably true. And I just call into question whether or not that's even the case. I I tend to think that it's more like a person who is witnessing a magic trick. And like, we watch a magic trick and we're like, how, like, how on like what how on earth did he do that or how on earth did she do that and we're confused and we we don't understand but like like not being able to understand it or not knowing exactly like how it happened doesn't mean that if we were to be able to peer under the curtain we wouldn't see how the magic trick occurred and Oftentimes when you're watching magic, when you figure out the trick, you're like, ah, oh, like, <laughs> like, I know, like, oh, I see how he did that. Like the little sleight of hand there five seconds before. And I'm not saying that a resurrection claim is like a magic trip directly, but it's the same type of thing. Like we have a veil of ignorance, which is that the gospels are highly theological propagandistic works of moral um, import. And all of the people writing about it are people who believed it. It's, uh, yeah, it's just not the kind of evidence that historians should be convinced by. I thought it was interesting at the end, and I don't remember if it was online or offline, but he wanted our next debate to be about whether miracles could even happen. And I thought I was super clear that I don't, I have no a priori position that miracles can't happen. It's merely just that we were there to talk about what kind of evidence would we need to accept that it was like, I, at no point do I, am I, at least I hope I wasn't coming across as saying that I thought miracles were impossible. But you, right. And I, I think you were clear. And I think he's saying that because he wants to, um, cap, like he wants to sort of put you in that position of being, um, immune to any type of evidence. But that's, um, like whenever that happens, see, Christians just, they don't like Paul, you, you, you and I have been there closer than Cam, I think, uh, closer to yep. Mike, Mike's version of Christianity. We've been there. And it, it's just baffling to them, how can you not believe this? Like, seriously. Wh- and, and the only thing they can come up with is, well, you just have this huge predisposition against miracles. You just think, you're just overly skeptical and thinking that this could never happen. And and this is this is how they explain it internally in their head, that um, they, they don't once, I, well, let me be careful. I think it's hard for them to say that guys like us have carefully looked at the evidence and concluded, no, it's more likely than not that this man didn't rise from the dead. The evidence is not sufficient. We are not convinced. And um, so I think that's why he wants to talk about miracles next. And if he does, just become an Orthodox Jew for the whole debate. And, and <laughs> Point, yeah. And you're done. Like, basically... 
Orthodox Jews, they believe in miracles. They believe in Yahweh and, and the power and strength and miracles. And they don't believe the claims in the New Testament, at least not all of them. Yeah, he, he just didn't see how there are multiple explanations. And the problem is, even if Jesus raised from the dead, the way God aligned the evidence, much like he did with evolution, is like, or the old earth or whatever. Man, there sure is a lot of evidence that looks like God didn't do anything here. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, if, if you start with a neutral position, of, if, if you don't start with a conclusion, it's kind of hard to leap to that God thing. And I just don't see how, I think I established that there's really only two men who are out there making claims who could have known um, Peter and Peter and Paul. I, I don't think I would have conceded Peter. <laughs> Well, yeah, see, I, I'm uncertain about that because the claim that he referenced that was a direct claim of Peter seeing um, a risen Jesus was the claim from Second Peter, which a consensus, consensus of historians think is a forgery and wasn't written sure. by Peter. Um, but the problem is, is that even though we have Paul attesting that what he was preaching is the same thing as what Peter was preaching, we don't actually have in the New Testament an account by himself um, as being a, you know, of the character of the type of uh, resurrection appearance he had. Um, and so his resurrection appearance could have been just like what Paul's was, you know, like seeing a heavenly Jesus or whatever it was, and the account could have grown into something. And But I think the problem with Mike um, in his uh, way of doing historical criticism is that when he reads the evidence, he's thinking about the... Um, the stories that are told within the gospels and within acts because those are the stories that he believes and so when he's hearing about peter and paul when he's reading the first corinthians 15 creed he's imagining those stories from the gospel and he sees the first corinthians creed as like as backing up those gospel claims anyway right but you two like i, I respect you two a lot so i would love to know like so i take my affirmation of peter from galatians 4 where they meet and even though in what what he says was it's weird in galatians 4 because he first says um everyone affirm my message except he kind of throws peter under the bus uh you know right after that but at least in my head do you guys you guys would agree with me that probably paul met peter right like pro and so i think it was easy for me from that to say that at least Peter was out preaching. Oh, no, I would have conceded what, exactly how you did. Okay. Um, no, I, no, I would have conceded that, but I guess I was more saying even... Um, I, I was more trying to comment on how uh, it's problematic um, to do what Mike is doing with those claims about Peter, and I don't think that you were doing that. Okay. But um, it's problematic because of the assumption of all, like all of the other evidence that he brings into it, which is like the evidence from the Gospels and, and from Acts. Right. Like, I'm totally with you that Peter didn't write first or second Peter. I mean, he didn't even speak. Well, he may have sp spoke Greek, but he sure didn't write it because Acts 4, again, I'm, I'm appealing to Acts, which I don't believe. But if you take their book... Acts four says they were unschooled, which you know means that they didn't couldn't write. Paul, so. when, as soon as he, I'm not sure who brought up the consensus of scholarship first. If it, it was him, because he started, right? He did. Yeah. As soon as he does that, what you should ask is: there any consensus of scholarship that you disagree with? Boom! You're at that point. He ha he'll have to say yes, and then at that point, he says, "Okay, we're on the same level field. We we don't agree with the consensus of scholarship on some things." On other things, yes. Some things, no. And um, and so when he's pulling out the consensus, you can say, "Well, yeah, I, I just I disagree with that." Just so like I noticed he never brought that, he never brought that back up after, like in my opening statement. I kind of thought he was going to go there, so that's why I said had it in my notes. Um, like he never brought up consensus afterwards when I said we can both trot out PhDs. See my or, or did or. My theory is that you agree with the consensus of scholarship way more than he does. 
Probably. And I, but I don't think, I think if he's, Mike, if you're listening right now, you're, you're pulling your heart and go, what in the world are you talking about? No, that's not true. But um, the consensus of scholarship is that half the, of uh, Paul's letters are forgeries. And that, the, and that Mark didn't, that these are not eyewitness accounts in the gospels or n- neither even sourced by them. Like just the evangelical New Testament scholars think this. <laughs> and there's a <laughs> lot of Christian New Testament historians who even agree with that, like that these are not uh, a historical analysis and not, and they were written uh, probably during a time when all these people who could have walked with Jesus are dead. Which is one of the things that when I have anger still sometimes towards, I don't have anger towards anyone who taught me, but I do feel like I, people were deliberately leaving things out in my education and my Bible school education. And, um, I feel like that was something that they deliberately left out was um, even if my particular Bible school profs didn't accept it, they didn't tell me that there was an opposite view. Yeah. And And when they do tell you there's an opposite view, opposite view, especially from the background we come from, Paul, is they put the L word in there, liberal. And so Christians, please, please hear me here. There are nice people that you would probably love to golf with or go bowling with who do their job the best they can. They call themselves historians and they don't agree with your church pastor, what he's preaching. Okay. (laughs) And they're not evil. They're not trying to kill Christianity. They're doing their jobs. But I also think that there's a lot of pastors who are learning this stuff. Like I didn't get, you know, to the, to the seminary level. I think that there are pastors who are learning this stuff, but are keeping it from their congregations. Yeah, I, I think there's some of that going on. I think, I think there's probably way more pastors than we can imagine or think or say that are doubting uh, and really don't even believe this stuff anymore. But they're still up there because that's all they have to do. What are they going to do? Quit their job and, yeah. and become a custodian at a school, Christian school, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> There are some in my town who I know who are in that position. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, so go ahead. I was just saying there was one part where, um, like, if I was scoring this as a fight and you know, I had cards, mm-hmm. there was one p- spot where Mike put a nice jab on your chin. And that's when um, I forget the exact details, but it was about Axe. And he brought up, well, you yeah, were the one who. Axe. Yeah, you, you're the one who brought up Axe. And now you're not believing something out of Axe. <laughs> So Paul had used um, Acts as a source of evidence for the uh, content or type of um, Paul, you know, New Testament Paul's um, uh, experience of Jesus. And then, you know, when it came back up, uh, Mike turned it around on you. Um, You should have been like, oh, I'm doing an internal critique, Mike. Yes, that's exactly (laughs) what I would have said if I was in that position. I'm just entering your worldview, Mike. I'm, I'm, I'm doing an internal critique. If I'm coming from your worldview, this is what I'm, what I have to work with. Yeah, I'm writing that down. Yeah, I, I felt I got knocked out there. And also, um, I need to go check my video. I sure hope I didn't say that it was only theologians who use the uh, critique of embarrassment or the principle of embarrassment. Um, so I was going through my script in my head at the time, and then I didn't pay atten- careful enough attention. He threw me there. Um, yeah, so I, I don't recall. Um, I think I've watched that video. I don't recall what it is that you said, but I could tell that you had like doubt, like, oh, maybe I did actually say that. And you may well have, because, you know, sometimes we say these things that on right. like reflection, we don't, um, we don't agree with. Um, but I think that uh, Mike made some pretty critical errors there too. So for example, he conflated um, what's called the you know criterion of embarrassment and the criterion of dissimilarity. And those are actually those are actually different things. They're not the same thing. Um, and what, what's he, the second one, I'm actually not super familiar with that second one. So dissimilarity is used by Jesus studies uh, folks, particularly people wanting to um, reconstruct, you know, what the probable historical Jesus was like. Okay. And it's used to um, it, it's it's 
the case when content in particular sayings within the text are dissimilar to those that would be expected in the background context of him being a Jew. And then there's also this criterion of double dissimilarity, which is kind of like the reverse and it's kind of confusing. <laughs> um, it's, it's, which is why, you know, so many um, scholars have commented on um, uh, how problematic these criteria are for uh, tea leaving uh, historical Jesus content from the Gospels. Um, but the criterion of embellish embarrassment, far from being um, an uncontroversial criterion in historical Jesus studies, um, it actually has been critiqued by a number of prominent uh, uh, historians and you are right in your claim Paul that it isn't actually used or at least very rarely used outside of Jesus studies um, which I think is what you were trying oh, to I claim was, I, I knew full well that Bart used it but it was always in the context of the New Testament they don't apply it to you know other ancient texts it seems like to me or even modern texts yeah that, I, I agree with you there okay uh, we have a whole bunch of questions, but I'm going to save those for the end. Um, were you looking at the chat and the live stream, or no, I have not seen a minute of the chat at all? Okay, yeah. So definitely, uh, and it was going by so fast anyway. But yeah, definitely watch the replay later, and uh, there were some good comments in there. Were you what? Were you <laughs> reading the Facebook things that Cam? Cam and I actually didn't say too much during the whole thing to you. Maybe one no, or two you, comments. You, I know you you messaged me one thing uh, and it was already in my notes. No, I was like like I was I had you know I was taking notes uh, the whole time every whenever he would speak because um a lot of times when I'm in these discussions they tend to go down rabbit holes and then I actually want to be able to breadcrumb my way back to what the main point was. I think that if there's one thing I'm happy with without having watched it again was that I think I was able to keep it relatively on what I wanted the point to be uh, as opposed to going off into he often accuses someone of saying you bring up contradictions to distract from the main point that we were on or, or you know you bring up um side things to distract and i was hoping that i wasn't doing that i was staying on the main thread on the topic of miracles because i think that's a huge thing for mike that uh he thinks that guys like us just don't believe in miracles and therefore we just dismiss all these claims i think I, if that if you have another chance to talk to mike i think i've said this to mike before <clears throat> But one criteria that I think is the umbrella criteria for a lot of these historical claims of the fantastical is the principle of analogy, and which, mm. ba which basically means, and this is how I would phrase it to a guy like Mike. Mike, I hand you a book. You open it up. You don't know anything about the book. And it says that uh, a guy, Godzilla yeah, Godzilla yeah. destroyed a city or a guy walks on water. You don't know where this book com comes from. Are you going to immediately put this into, uh, are you going to shift this towards fiction or do you, are you going to shift this towards history? I think every honest Christian on the planet has to say, this is more likely fiction. If they don't know. I don't think he's there yet. Because it seems like he, he's able to critically think about the, like when he was asked other questions about the other books, he was able to make that clearly, but there's still some fog about his special pleading. Well, I, I think if he knows that this book that he's reading is not the Bible, he would say, yeah, this is more likely fiction than fact. But I would, he would say, like he should, uh, well, we need more. We need more, like, what else do we know about this book? Well, let's keep reading. Well, what if I, and you just slowly add in all the pieces of evidence that are found in the New Testament, you add it in for the green monster. Well, in the book, uh, it says that there, there was 500 witnesses to this. Would you shift this back more towards his, history now from fiction? And, and I think a reasonable person would say, well, no, not necessarily, because that could be just part of the story. I'm shocked how quickly he threw out the 500 people. He just tossed that aside. I don't, um, I don't remember that. he. What did he say? He... He said, let's just assume that 500 people didn't happen. Yeah, he did say that. Focus on the, let's focus the 12. on the 12. And the 12. Uh, I think I know why he did that, though. Because it's only 
because historians say that if you have more than one source, it's more reliable. It's only mentioned once in the whole New Testament. And, and it, no, I think that that's a much more principled way of explaining it than it's probably credit to Mike. I, I think he probably didn't want to just die on that hill when it's such a hard claim to back up. Yeah, maybe. You, you know, when, when he has something better, which is, you know, when he thinks that he has a better argument for the 12. Or like um, one of the linchpins for Christians is First Corinthians 15, the creed, right? That, mm -hmm. that it goes way back to the early times and so forth, which historians do say that. Um, just take that creed and just change a few words so it doesn't apply to Jesus, applies to another figure in history that has a fantastical claim or whatever, and say, well, what is the real evidence of this is, creed is true? What do we have? This is actually the first thing we do have and yet there's no evidence backing it up at all. Well, the funny thing, I like the, 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 their, their desire to early date it. And when I was an early Christian, I don't think that everyone was so anxious to make this a creed super early dated. Their, their zeal to early date it means that Paul can't have known about it. Like it means that literally Paul's just wrote, it's hearsay. Yeah, he's repeating stuff that he's heard from other people, right? Um, yeah, so I don't know. It's, it's very unconvincing to me. Um, do you feel like I was going way out on a limb when I said that there was only like the other apostles, um, we don't have any evidence for Like, was I out on a limb there? No. Not so, my opinion. <laughs> we don't even know that there was 12 disciples. Well, right. Right. <laughs> I kept bringing up like Bartholomew and Matthew because like those are like ones that are like so vaguely attested. Like, and is is, is Peter Cephas really? Are you sure Peter Cephas is Cephas Peter? Are you sure really? Is there any reason to doubt that these two people might be the same person or not? Like, yeah. Um. So I find that there's a real readiness. Uh, both within apologists and also within um, New Testament historians to conflate the concept of disciple and the concept of apostle. So the Pauline literature only attests to um, the concept of apostles and never talks about discipleship. It never talks about um, uh, being a disciple in the sense of being witness to the ministry of Jesus on earth. And I actually think that there's the distinction between these two things in particular by apostle, what is meant within the Pauline literature is somebody who, um, it's, I think it's a social construct. It's, they've been accepted by the community as like a messenger of um, God. But I think it does carry with it this idea that they have um, witnessed Jesus. Um, because Paul considers that to be like the criteria as to why he can be considered an apostle, where he says, have I not seen uh, Jesus? And um, so I don't know. I think him calling them 12 apostles is him kind of saying that they saw something. But the problem is, is that it's not actually telling us what they saw um, or what their evidence was. It's just a claim. I guess I'm just thinking of this now. Like I kept saying, well, it's really only ten. Um, like Matthias, who was replaced the replacement apostle. We guess we don't even know that he was part of the people who witnessed resurrected Jesus either. So I don't well, and Paul not only that, that, yeah, and there are other apostles within the Pauline epistles that aren't disciples, right? Okay. But so I, what I mean by that is that, like. If the 12 is a signifier for the 12 disciples minus, Jesus, uh, minus Judas, then like, well, why are there other people who are called the 12, uh, sorry, other people who are called apostles within the, um, within, within the epistles? Uh, like a great question that, uh, oh, go ahead, Paul. All I was, I was going to ask, um, was I too far on a limb to say that a miracle is the lowest probability event from a historical perspective? Was that too far on a limb? If you can't say that, no, I don't know what I you can say. 
I think that's right. I think the mistake is to do what Bart Ehrman did, which is to say the histor- uh, the a miracle is by definition the lowest probability uh, claim or explanation. Therefore, um, it's the lowest probability explanation. Right. Um, because I, I think the, I agree. The, my view is that if if there's two things that have equal explanatory power, the miracle can't win. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And even if they have unequal explanatory power, the natural explanation can definitely um, win out over the miracle explanation because of how low the likelihood is of the miracle claim being true. Okay, guys, I, I got to, there's a lot of, actually, there's a, quite a few Christians in the live stream and they're going crazy right now. And they're saying we're, okay. being, we're making just many assertions probably we're being biased. I'm going to go through the questions first, and then we'll discuss if we're going to let any of them in. <laughs> this room only holds four, though. Um, let me scroll up. Wanna, if you really want to get into it, you can boot me off. <laughs> uh, so, guys, if, if you're feeling uneasy, if you're feeling unloved, unheard, type tag me, and I'm going to start down the list here. We're going to answer these one at a time quickly. Um, Shannon Q asks, why is Paul so hot? Because he's a Canadian Mennonite. There's the answer. Dean Meadows asks, Paul, what do you think is the best evidence against your position? I'm assuming the position is that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Uh, the best evidence uh, against my position. Boy, I, I'm used to the, the, uh, the Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, I, I got nothing. Um, okay, well, let me help, help you. Here, let, let me help you with this. And don't, they're going to cry. Okay, you got to prepare yourself mentally because when you give your answer, they're going to yep. scream, they're going to scream a word at you. And the word's fallacy. Okay. But that's okay. That's okay. Just say, um, I think the absence of evidence is my evidence against the resurrection. And then let them scream at you for about five minutes. And then you, can give, <laughs> then you can give a little analogy and saying, look, if someone makes a pretty amazing claim that, that they shot and killed a guy and stuck them in the trunk of their car, and I go open the trunk of that car and I don't see a body. I, Hold I, on, I'm confused. I'm confused. Dean was asking the question, what's the best evidence against your position? Against, against, he's asking what's the best evidence that there was no bodily resurrection. I think that's what Dean's asking. Dean, if you're in the uh, live stream, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So, I mean, I can, I can imagine all kinds of evidence that there, that it would be nice if we had that could convince me to change my position. Um, but, but of the stuff that we have, I, I don't know. I, I would answer it the same way as, um, I would say Dean, like, look, um, it, it's the same question as asking, what's your best evidence against that uh, Gabriel appeared to Muhammad in a cave and gave the very words of Allah to him? I would say, again, it's the lack of evidence is my best evidence. So uh, I think they can actually understand that example better than maybe even the, um, the dead man in the trunk. But uh, next question, we shouldn't spend too much time. Uh, Joe DiPilato, what's the purpose of life? Uh, to enjoy the sorrows of others. Um, <laughs> uh, so Rob asks, why aren't I debating all three of you? Oh, he, Rob is one of the guys. You know who Rob is? Sentinel Ap Apologetics? Um, oh, General yeah. Han Solo. I sure do. The problem I have with you, Rob, and you're probably still here listening, is you are a slow talker and you just drive me crazy. <laughs> and you tend to ramble. And, uh, but I'm not. Go ahead, Paul. The other problem I have with Rob, uh, I love you, Rob, uh, is that I believe, I feel like he uses the real definition of ad hoc, and that is he's got, his con he's got a conclusion. And Rob finds ways to justify that he'll find some Hebrew translation or something else that that allows him to have his feet in both worlds and have his cake and eat it too. When really, I say, if you're just inter if it's all just down to how we interpret the book, um, then I'm unconvinced. 
Iron Charioteer asks you, Paul, uh, why didn't you bring up um, basically dying and rising gods? Uh, more the um, maybe it's maybe Jesus existed, but the narrative was maybe crafted from prior beliefs at the time. Uh, because of my experience with my own family, uh, I, if I bring up mythicist positions, uh, much like I don't curse on my channel, um, I find that there are certain things that turn off, even if they're fully valid. There are certain things that I know stop the people that I want to communicate to from listening. Um, so it's not that I don't believe them myself or that I they say they're incredible, but um, because I specifically want to talk to non-Christians, and I was one, I know what stops the thinking. Got it. Randomals asks, are all former Mennonite Canadians as pasty as you guys? Answer is yes. Yes. Uh, Joe DiPilato asks, if Jesus was re resurrected, what kind of evidence would you actually expect, given the political climate? Interesting question. I, I have um, my answer. Well, so the few things. So if, if Matthew is accurate, I would want to see... Uh, sec I think that the fact that zombies were roaming the street in Matthew 25 uh, 27. is... 27, pardon me. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's got to be written about, right? Someone that's got to be talked about for years and years to come that there were the things um, that there, I know that people talk about certain eclipses, but I think, um, you know, the, the sun going dark, the, the, the curtain being torn into uh, these are things that I, I know that absence of evidence is, isn't a, uh, the reverse of absence and absence of evidence. Um, but I feel like those are things that could reasonably have been written about if these events happened. And I'll let the rest of you guys answer. Yeah, I agree. I, I would say that um, if Jesus, as depicted in the New Testament, actually rose from the dead, and if those things that is, ta is talked about right next to it happened, there's verses that says that, that the miracles of Jesus was known all throughout um, um, Syria. Um, I would expect someone, I would expect some contemporary evidence we have zero zero there's nothing written about jesus during the lifetime of jesus that we have found to date i would expect something if uh jesus actually rose from the dead and actually cares about people's salvation of you know the reason why he uh, rose from the dead i would expect him to show up and say hey Pilate, remember me you're the guy who uh sent me to the to the cross here i am i would expect uh if jesus really cared he would um to appear to more enemies than just Paul. I don't consider James an enemy of Christ. How about you, Cam? Um, it's, a, it's a difficult question because it, like answering it, I think requires you to make some assumptions about uh, who Jesus was and what his message was and things like that. But if his message was... Um, one of uh, like love and peace of providing salvation through his dying acts and intent for the world to be saved, um, which I think can be read out of the New Testament. I think I would expect to have seen him um, encouraging uh, as much uh, like causing of evidence in the world as he possibly could. So I think he would have um, met more people um, after he was resurrected, even if they weren't people who were trying to kill him um, or trying to kill his disciples, but he would have met more people across the world. Um, he would have uh, taught people how to preserve um, the facts of what was going on, you know, like the skills that the ancient historians had. Um, he would have taught people that in order to make sure that as many people in the future would be saved and convinced by his dying and salvific acts. Brian Dill asked if Jesus was resurrected and it was known to the public, wouldn't the Romans just publicly crucify him again? Uh, or wouldn't they all convert immediately? No, I think, Brian, you're right. I think they would crucify him at least nine times. I think Jesus has nine lives. <laughs> yeah. So actually, this brings up, for me, like, why were not the guards at the tomb converted and trotted out as, as you know, all over the place? Because how do we, 
presumably we have to know this story of, of their bribes from somewhere. Like who, who, who told the gospel writer about that bribe and, and why were these people not like celebrities in the Christian community? Like that doesn't make sense. You want to take this one? Kevin? Yeah. Uh, what was the claim? What was the comment again? Why wouldn't he? Um, yeah. What, sorry. What was it? I missed it. Why? Uh, why didn't the guards convert? They're the, in Matthew, they were guards at the tomb. They saw before the women, you hear this Christians? Before the women, the guards saw Jesus rise from the tomb and yet none of them converted that we know of. Now that doesn't mean that they didn't. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, maybe they had a short term um, memory lapse because didn't they get like knocked out by an angel or something? But uh, for the Christians listening who respect William Lane Craig, Here's the answer to that question. You guys won't be able to hear this because I don't have it set up. Uh, most scholars don't accept the historicity of the guard story. Uh, most scholars don't accept the historicity of the guard story. I basically just played a clip that says most scholars don't accept the historicity of the guard story. Uh, Cam's very familiar with that clip from William Lane Craig. The best strategy when talking to Christians is use other Christians as much as possible because they don't respect us. <laughs> I can't wait till he goes look watches that 2017 Gary Habermas clip that I was talking about yeah so another thing or something that I wanted to comment on um, it's about methodology the minimal facts approach which I think is effectively what M Mike is presenting as well as William Lane Craig and Gary Habermas I think it's intentionally um or sorry, not intentionally, but through the intent of limiting the scope to only be of certain facts, it misses the analysis of like the wider New Testament period and the wider New Testament literature. And so uh, William Lane Craig often discourages the um, assessment of contradictions in the Gospels as being relevant to the claims about the resurrection. But I actually think that that's wrong. I think that if we're finding evidence against our historical sources being unreliable in one area, then it actually pertains to their reliability in other areas too. Because if you think about it, imagine that you have a friend and your friend on a number of occasions lies to you and um, you know tells you some kind of false story. When a person claims in the future something else, are you going to believe them? you're going to be less likely to, right? That's the way that things work. When we hear untrustworthy people, we trust them less in the future. And I think that that's the case. And that's why things like contradictions in the Gospels are actually relevant, even if we are only considering minimal facts. Mike, the atheist asks, uh, Pine Creek, which is the best, uh, which argument is the best direction for Christians? If I put myself in the Christian worldview back where I was uh, about seven to 10 years ago, I would say martyrdom, uh, and this is why I think Christians bring it up time, and Mike brought it up tonight, martyrdom, time and time again. Why would anyone die for a lie? Like, come on, get serious. Why would they die for something they, they, know, they know it happened? They wouldn't die if they knew it didn't happen. It doesn't make sense. And, but uh, as you correctly pointed out, um, Paul, that we don't know first of all, exactly why these people died. Like even Paul, he could have been killed just for preaching the gospel. Sure. Right? And so can you imagine Paul being asked the question, Paul, if you reject, if you recant that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again, we will spare your life. Do we know that happened? We don't know that happened. We also don't know that that it, it could easily have happened. They trotted him out and he, they recanted and then they killed him anyway. Like all the possibilities are open. Exactly. Like Paul could have said, you know what, guys, I, yeah, you're right. It could be a, vi it could have been a vision on the Damascus road. I, you know, I, I struggle with epilepsy or psychos, some, <laughs> you know, I better not go there, but um, that could be his thorn in his, in his flesh, right? Some uh, mental illness, but um <laughs> Uh, yeah, he could have recanted, and the Romans said, okay, uh, but we're going to kill you anyhow for sedition and just being, causing trouble. 
we just don't know. My answer to that one is actually personal experience. I think personal experience is the the one thing that like I can never argue against someone uh, else's personal yeah, experience. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I felt when at my lowest point, I felt Jesus with me. You can't you can't tell me that wasn't Jesus, Doug. He, like I can point out that there's other possibilities, but I can't. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like your answer better, Paul. Hunter Bailey asks, question, how does Apologia feel about James' death for the Christian view? I don't want to know. I don't understand that question. Do you? So James, if I remember right, is the one actual apostle. He, Herod beheaded James, right? In in Acts. Am I remembering that right? Acts 4. Um, no. Where, where was it? No. Herod killed one of them. Beheaded them. Um, again, but I, so let's say I'm remembering that completely wrong. It doesn't matter. Um, oh, well, there's also, I guess this Josephus references James. If they're talking about brother of Jesus, James, um, Josephus does mention that's where it is. Josephus says X 12 that he, he was, he was killed. Um, it doesn't matter because just what we were talking about, we have no idea that he was given a chance to recant. We have no idea. Uh, the circumstances are around any of that. We don't know. Maybe he wasn't even a believer and he was just associated with the group and was killed for, you know, guilty by association. It's just, we don't know enough to, to weaken it. And I did acknowledge that uh, um, Stephen, who wasn't one of the people uh, and, and James were the two that we had a message. We had, we knew what to happened to them. So I don't think it affects my position. I and Chair Tier asks you, Paul, uh, what do you think of John Dominic Crossan saying Jesus was just a metaphor? Oh, don't say just, it was real. Um, metaphors are real and powerful. Uh, so what do you think of John Dominic Crossan saying that Jesus' resurrection was a meta metaphor uh, for living uh, a nonviolent good life? So here's where I'll go back to my Christian pr perspective. Um, that, I can't, I would have called that person and not a Christian. When I was a Christian, that person wasn't one. Same with me. Uh, just like I would have said that uh, Catholics weren't Christians, or I would have, any liberal person who said, if there was someone in my life who said there was one error in the Bible, I would have said they weren't a Christian. Any Christian so, who, like John Dominic Crossan, who says this is a metaphor, I would have said, you're a weak need liberal Christian. Get out of my church. Exactly. Well, John, John Dominic Crossan... Um, doesn't really even believe in God from well, that's worse. any type of Christian point of view. I, mean, he, I don't think he's an atheist. I think he's like a panentheist, but like it's a very, very like non-theistic version of God. Like someone has proposed to me, what if I grew up as a Catholic instead of as a Mennonite and then presented with the same evidence? I would have said, yeah, I probably would have found ways, like I think Rob does, to justify all this stuff that I, the new information I was learning, uh, when you grow up thinking it's inerrant and that, you know, 99% is the same as zero, then it's quite easy for your faith to shatter quickly. Joe De Palato asks, what's your end goal, Paul, for debating Mike? Don't you want Mike to remain a Christian? Uh, no. Uh, well, uh, there might be personal circumstances in his life where it might be better for him to remain a Christian, but I would, my ultimate goal is that people have examined their faith and looked at, like I looked at their own epistemology, looked at all the facts. My thing that I'm frustrated with myself was that I didn't actually look at all the facts. And so I actually have no problems with Christians. If the Christian knows as much as I know now and they keep their faith, great because they've learned everything um i feel like it's unfair though as long as they're the not who are pushing the homosexuals off of buildings well, <laughs> i mean there's there's exceptions but uh, but uh, i'm i my more intent is i wish that i knew more i wish that i had examined my own faith deeper and not taken i, I my church was big on authority and you just accept whatever the authorities tell you and so if someone here's everything I say. And they say, you know what? I accept all those facts and I'm still a Christian. You know, at least, at least you examine the evidence and you had your chance. But Paul and I were talking last night. Uh, and the one piece of advice I gave you, Paul was remember the, the Christians watching, think about them more than Mike, because, um, the hardcore Christians, they're going to be cheering for Mike and saying, amen, hallelujah, 
hallelujah, I'm going to be sharing this video to all my Christian friends. The atheists in there are saying, yeah, good job, Paul. You're showing that this, this evidence is poor, lacking, and so forth. And so you got the, you know, everybody's going to cheer for their guy no matter what. But there's going to be a few people in there who are leaning maybe a little bit Christian, a little bit atheist, kind of, and they're going to, how Paul handles himself is going to speak volumes. It's, and I, for better or for worse, I know that argument should reign supreme, right? But for better or for worse, just the fact that, Paul, you, you came off as a nice guy, um, considerate guy, who's not just calling Mike an idiot, um, will give these fence setters, I'll call them, um, an opportunity to, to try to even listen to you, to not dismiss you right away. Well, and, and that's, you know... I, I, it's so fresh. I remember being in their position and I remember what I may or may not have listened to. So I, I appreciate that compliment. Uh, Nadine, I was wondering if the other guys in the non sequitur debate believed in the aliens. Roswell met his witness criteria nicely. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, actually, we, we talked about that afterwards uh, after the show went off air. No, they don't believe in aliens. In fact, Steve was asking Mike a bit about aliens. So. Joe is asking a lot of questions. What if Jesus is God and all the authors just suck at writing good accounts of him? Well, then we're stuck, aren't we, Joe? We're stuck. Um... Uh oh, camera muted or Tips for a closeted atheist that lives in the Bible Belt. Oh, I've answered that question before on a different stream. It depends on how uh, old you are. <laughs> yeah, it depends on whether you're still financially responsible or financially dependent on your, your family. Um, but the other flip side of that is um, I was outed against my will. I wasn't ready yet. Oh, really? Um, mm -hmm. Do I remember this? And so like, um, maybe we didn't talk. Yeah. But... Um, it's it's far better to control your own narrative and so don't once you are past the point of being financially oh and the other, the other example the, the advice i give is um if you are financially dependent just start disagreeing with one or two doctrines here and there um just saying oh, i'm not completely sure if i agree about hell or i completely disagree like try and find some minor doctrines just to start to set the temperature so that they're not shocked, I guess, um, and and see how those dialogues go. <clears throat> Hunter Bailey, I've never talked to you before. If you want to come in, I'll allow it. I don't think I've talked to you face to face. Do you know Hunter Bailey? I don't. He's uh, messaged me once or twice, so I know he's not a troll or anything like that. I don't even know. The if name he's still sounds. Here. But. Um, I think a lot of Christians, because they care about this so much, but if they are having doubts, if they are questioning these things, they need, um, number one, they need an out, then they need an explanation. The out I would give is keep your belief in God. Keep it there. Keep it strong even. But if you're questioning Christianity, um, I would say... To start really slow and just ask yourself the question, let's say Jesus didn't rise from the dead. What evidence could we still have? Could we still have the evidence we have in the New Testament if Jesus didn't rise from the dead? Just entertain that thought in your head for 10 minutes. And when the 10 minutes is up, let it go. Otherwise, you're going to freak yourself out. But for 10 minutes, just say, okay, Jesus did not rise from the dead. He did not rise from the dead. He did not rise from the dead. Could I still have that creed in 1 Corinthians 15? Yeah, I think I could. Could I still have Paul having this experience? Yeah, he still could have. Could we still see the epistles as they are? Could we still have the gospels like we see them? Yeah, we could. 
And if you get to that point, yeah, I think it's basically over. But um, I don't know. What do you think of that? <laughs> yeah, well, that's actually that was kind of where I was trying to drive. You you worded it better than I was in the in the debate, but. Um... I guess I was trying to jump ahead and, and, and explain there are other ways that we could have the evidence we have. It's, it's, there's, um, there's more than one possible explanation, which is what I don't deny that, um, an all, an all knowing God who's all powerful could explain a lot of things. I mean, that obviously can explain a lot of stuff. Um, but, but is it, is it required? Is it needed? Is there anything in the evidence that is only explained by an all-powerful God, and I came to the conclusion, no. If there was no heaven or no hell, no afterlife, would you still be a Christian? Yeah, I ask that question a lot, Brian. Um, like J John Dominic Crossan, he's still Christian, uh, and I don't think he believes in afterlife. Uh, even the, the guy I interviewed, um, Dennis R. McDonald, he calls himself a Christian atheist, I think. And so it depends what you mean by Christianity, I guess. But the, the principles of nonviolence or pacifism or turning the other cheek, things that are attributed to Jesus a lot, um, at least Mennonites do that. Yeah, and I have family members who have told me, <laughs> don't deconvert me, my life is, I like the way my life is. They like the sense of community. They like all that stuff, and they're, they've, specifically asked me, don't try to deconvert me because it would cost like the, the earthly benefits of their Christianity to them uh, are more important than, than um, investigating the true stuff. Do you think it's like that they would get into some existential angst if they left, like that they would have more anxieties and stuff like that? Or is it not that extreme? Well, no, I think it's more like, and, and I was in the situation Every human they know believes what they believe. You'd be start you start your social life from scratch. Your your business partners, your uh, the the people you have dinner with every week, the Bible study people, the people who carpool your kids. Like they, if they all believe what you believe, and you're suddenly the outsider, um, there's a social cost to that 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 they'd rather just hold on to. Yeah, at least in my family's case. I actually um, talked to a woman on Facebook today who has had a very similar background to me. And um, yeah, so it was interesting to relate stories on just how much, like when you, I don't know if this happened to you, Paul, but when you go to church, it's like people look at you differently, mm -hmm. <laughs> if they know. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times they treat you better because they're trying to, you know, pull you back in uh, but if you're married like my wife's I think a lot of my wife's friends at church I think they kind of pity her or feel like oh that's so sad oh, that this wonderful woman has an unbelieving husband those poor kids all oh, those poor kids like good chance they're gonna go to hell now oh it's a tragedy you know, you get, you can just, some of them have come out and said that to me, but from the rest, you can, you can just feel that oozing out of them, like that, ugh. Well, I think I mentioned this with you before, and I don't like to talk about it a lot, but I'll bring it up here, is like, very shortly after I was outed, um, I got my cancer diagnosis, and I had enough people tell me, well, this is God giving you a tap, like, <sighs> this is God trying to shake you back, that God let you have this. Not as a punishment, but so that it would be the crisis, right, to bring me back. And and that, those people I was done with. <laughs> but Yeah, I think if there's Christians listening, they're even saying, yeah, that's that's going too far. Like, they would, I think they would hope to say the, the sun and rain falls on the good and the lost and the, the, the goats, the sheep, whatever, alike. You know, it's like no matter who you are, good things and bad things happen. Um, but everything yeah. happens for a reason, right? That, that's also part of it. Yeah. And God works in various ways. I mean, you can, as I, that's what's frustrating about the Bible now. And I was trying to discuss that with Mike. If it all just comes down to interpretation, 
like I actually have a game on my Discord server where I have people try and give me a position and see and I to see if I can defend it with Bible verses. And I always can. Like I've yet to be presented with a position that I can't find. And not, granted, they're out of context or whatever. But when you're talking about interpretation, you pick what you want. It's always funny that people's God seems to have the same biases that they have. Yeah. Uh, Hunter Bailey, are you still around? This offer, it's a one-time offer here. So the reason why I think if, if anybody's having a, a, a debate or conversation, a dialogue about this issue of the resurrection, I think one of the first questions that you should ask, is there any claims in the New Testament that you think are probably false? that didn't actually happen in the past, didn't happen in history? Is there anything that the Bible says happened in history that you think maybe didn't? If their answer is no, I really don't know where you can go from there. Because it's not like you can now sit down and critically examine the historical evidence anymore. It's just all true from their perspective. And... Um, like even Michael Lacona, he will admit that, and he's been fired for that. But he's admitted that the zombies in Matthew 27 probably didn't happen in the past, even though if you read it, it, it sure reads like it's a claimed historical event. I didn't realize he'd been fired. That was interesting. This was some years ago. Okay. Okay, uh, Hunter Bailey, yeah, you're welcome to come in and you can ask us anything you want. I'm going to lock the room and then I'm going to put the link in the description. Use Chrome and just click the link. Uh, the link is appear.in forward slash Pine Creek. I don't think I need to put the other stuff in front of it. But if anybody else tries to come in, I'll be able to see you. Oh, and Hunter, please, please show your face. I want to see into your eyes and deep inside your soul when we're speaking to you. I want to delve deep. I'm usually a cartoon and my face is here, so. Well, yeah, but you don't do live streams. Um, no. But yeah, when you, you feel comfortable with a fellow Mennonite, and so that's why you show your face, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of these days, we have to have a crokinole tournament against each other. Absolutely. I'm pretty and I'll, good. I'll give you watermelon and roll cooking. I'm the second best in, uh, in Manitoba. My dad can beat me, but he's the only guy. <laughs> but you might be the best in the state where you currently live. Oh, yeah, that's for certain, yeah. There's no, but people don't even know what crokinole is in this state. I know. Come on in, Hunter. I was going to say my Canadian tire stores, stores carry crocodile boards, but that means nothing to anyone else either. So, I'm surprised um, I haven't seen any comments from Mike. Mike um, Winger. Because mm. he's here. He's here, all right. <laughs> If he's not here in person, he's here in spirit. Mm. So, Cam, was there anything else that I could have uh, brought up that I missed? But, I mean, probably, but I thought that you did really well, given the um, given the constraints of the format and the, the time that you had available to discuss. And I, I thought that you focused on the right things. I'm still learning, as we all are. I mean, uh, you know, it wasn't too much. It was just a very few years ago I'd have been on the other side of the debate. So I think, um, like, if I were to do a debate on the resurrection claim, I think I would probably focus on a little bit more on, like, the historical context and setting the stage and some prior examples of resurrection claims and, and you know other mythic themes in the gospels and things like you that mean some of the other like dying and rising gods yeah and well and resurrection claims um in even the like old testament literature for example okay i but, find some christians just yell zeitgeist and run away 
<laughs> yeah, well, the thing is, is that it's not the I'd have to consider it more carefully because it might not be good pragmatically to go that route. It might just be better to sort of respond to the evidence mm. that's brought up or just focus on the gospels themselves. But yeah. Hi, Hunter. Hi, Hunter. Hi. Uh, so you are the same Hunter Bailey I talked to on Facebook a while, like a week ago or something? Yes, sir. Okay, just wanted to make sure. And uh, yep. you are a born again evangelical Christian? Yes. Apparently so. That's not good enough for the book of life. Come on. So, um, but yeah, actually, I was we... going to say, Paul G, we actually have talked before with um, Rob as well. It was a year back, though. We were talking about James. That's why I brought it up. So, Hunter. You come to my live stream chat, you're in the live stream, you're looking at us, you're hearing us talk. What was the most aggravating thing you heard us say? Oh, um, it wasn't really just aggro. It was not like I was being aggravated. It was more like um, just some of the things I feel like were kind of like you brought up how uh, it seemed like there was a little bit of biases behind, like, for instance, an example is just simply uh, automatically <coughs> don't believe in miracles, right? Um, so it's just, it kind of seems like um, there's no opening to whether if it could be true or not. Like, that's just kind of about like but I think I a priori exclude miracles. Did, did you get that impression? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Did you get the impression that I uh, exclude miracles as a matter of course? I did, yeah, but I, I could be totally wrong, so forgive me for that. No, that's fine. I, I, I'm trying to hone, like, because I don't. Mm -hmm. um, again, I just feel like uh, when there's two, when there's two answers of equal explanation or a hundred answers, hang, or hang, hang on, Paul Hunter, do oh, you yep. do you believe Paul when he says that he believes that miracles are possible? Do you believe him? Yeah, I'll take his word for it. Do you believe me when I say miracles are possible? Yeah, I'll take a word for it. So, Hunter, if, if you were to give an argument um, for why you should consider before, before assessing the evidence, um, before your assessment, why you should consider a resurrection claim unlikely would you be able to do that wait repeat the question one more time because it was so what what i'm asking for, for you to do and maybe this is unfair so just totally reject it if you need to um but would you be able to give an argument for why a rational person somebody who you think is behaving reasonably should consider a resurrection claim to be uh, highly unlikely. Yeah, I kind of go by considering the evidence. Yeah, I kind of go by this. Um, I guess you can call it a philosophy or whatever. Um, I, it's almost like the only things that you really hold to is that which has been revealed to you. So, for instance, Paul Agia being a young earth creationist, the reason why he was one was because that's what was revealed to him as the only likely rational truth at the time and now he's gone to other sources and so therefore that's why he's gotten away from the young earth cre uh, creation idea and then it kind of took over with christianity as a whole so to me it's kind of like the reason why people don't believe in the resurrection is obviously because they haven't been revealed to the exact kind of material that let's say i've been possibly revealed to so it just depends on what your sources are. Who do you go to? Hunter, can you say that and one I more really, time? I, I, I thought I heard something, but I'm not sure. Say your last sentence again. I was saying that um, it really depends on like who, like what your sources are and who you go to and things like that. Because I, I try really hard not to stick to only Christian material. Uh, I try to kind of take my Christian world, Christian beliefs out and try to really see both sides. But I thought I heard you say that. Well, I, I, I'm just going to paraphrase. One of the things you you think that guys like us don't believe it is because we haven't read what you've read. 
No, I think it's uh, I think everybody believes what they believe based on what has been revealed to them. And that's all they know versus if I was to literally bring you like the evidence that you are exactly looking for. Right. That would change your mind. Right. If it's cold, hard proof, it's been shown to be factual. That would change your mind. But you won't believe it until that's been revealed to you until you've actually seen it. Right. So I think that's the case for literally anybody. It's all based on what you know until new inf information comes about. That's how we, I mean, generally work every day. But you don't feel that Ooh. Cam, Paul, and myself, that we're lacking some key knowledge, do you? Um, I think there's just things that both of, uh, on both sides that we could be missing out on. Like, for instance, I don't know everything that you guys know, and you may not know everything that I know. So it can it can be a growing thing for all of us to kind of actually try to listen to both sides instead of just, you know, doing the whole pointy figures. No, you're wrong. I'm right. And there's nothing you can say or do about it kind of thing, which on both sides, that's kind of what you get. And I know you'll see a hand behind me. My buddy Tony is just chilling. Don't worry about him. <laughs> so is it what we don't know or is it who reveals it to us? Um. Not who reveals it to you, but what what actually it is that you do know. So, for instance, like when it comes to doctorate level people, well, they definitely know somebody possible. Well, it's more, more likely than not. They would know more about somebody who's in an undergrad level. Correct. And so and if it was the like in a different I idea or field or whatever like that. Say like somebody who is completely against evolution, since that got kind of brought up with Mike. Um, and then somebody comes along who has a doctorate in biology and shows him all of this stuff and he changes his mind. Well, it's not that, you know, somebody revealed it to him. It's what actually has been revealed to him as the evidence. So that now he knows what actually, um, based on what he's seen, can make that conclusion. So pretty much we really just go towards where, what we see, what we generally have been uh, shown, and we kind of make our own conclusions about that. So I'm based on Cam here for a minute. So Does that make sense though? I hope that makes sense. I, I'm not trying to like, sure. I'm not calling y'all like. You're basically like saying that we all have our kind of standards of what we find sufficient to believe. I think that's what you're saying, right? That's part of it. But there's more to it. So, um, so we are aware of you know a number of people who've become PhD level um, experts in biblical textual studies or biblical studies who started out as Christians, uh, but ended up you know either as agnostics or atheists. Um, are you from? Are you aware of anyone who started out as an atheist or agnostic, but then um, because they earned a PhD? Uh, became a theist, became a Christian? Um, it Actually, I see people who have joined PhDs. Like, no, I haven't, to your question, but at the same time, I've seen people who have gotten um, PhDs and in the same exact field of material and stayed as hardcore question, Christian. Yeah, I mean, I guess you're, you are proposing that there's some almost an agnostic style uh apologetic where we are just if there was just a few key things we could learn uh, and i think doug's next question will be what are some of those things um are you're suggesting that the, that the three of us are missing some key pieces of information i think honestly um it just depends on what you see and how you interpret it because for instance i agreed a lot with what mike said y'all didn't yet we all generally got the same thing right um, so I guess it just comes with how, well, I don't mean to like say this in like kind of like a, uh, like in we a bad way. Skin, we can take it. Do it. We have thick skin. We can take it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say it's really depending on, I guess it has to do with our presuppositions based on what like information comes to us. Like for instance, with Mike, um, you like apology, you don't believe in acts, right. As historically accurate, uh, yet. Me as a Christian, I would, same as Mike. So based on that alone, that we would interpret it something based on what is said in Acts. Like, for instance, saying that um, Paul 
um, was um, vouched for by Peter in Acts, right? Yet you wouldn't use that because you don't think it's historical versus me, I do. And that's because I believe in it and you don't. So see how that kind of differs and hey, how we would look at that. Hunter, there's like I, there's probably a thousand questions that we could ask each other. Um, let's keep it really short and succinct. Do you okay. do you know why Paul doesn't think Acts is historical? Can you like list one or two or three of them? Three reasons why he might not. No, I don't. you don't. No, I don't know. No. Is there any reason for you personally to doubt that at least portions of Acts may not be historical? I have no reasons to know. Have you looked into? why acts may not be historical have you read anything of why acts may not be historical at least in certain portions yeah so i've actually looked at a lot of books with new testament and old testament um and pretty much based on like again i gotta really i really try to take my presupposition out of it um uh, and see like you we're familiar with second peter right how scholars generally agree that it might not have been written by peter Right. right. But of course, there's always those people who would, <laughs> as New Testament scholars would disagree, right, um, that it could be written by Peter. The same thing how you mentioned William Lane Craig saying that he doesn't hold the historicity or I'm sorry, scholars don't hold the historical of the garden. But yet at the same time, most scholars would say that Jesus at least existed and was crucified. See what I'm saying? So it depends on what how you hold things and how you interpret the evidence. Anybody can make up any kind of hypothesis, but you really, I think you got to take that presupposition away and take that, take whatever biasness you have. And I'm not saying y'all do, I'm just talking in general and look at where it points to. And me personally, I think it points to Christ and that he was resurrected. Okay. Fair That's enough. just me. Uh, we've been asking you some questions. Why don't you pick one of us and ask a question? Um, okay. Um, apologia. You were a young earth creationist, right? Correct. So when you're so when you got out of young earth creationism, did you actually look for alternatives to maybe just it's the young earth creationist view, or did you just like how did that happen from young earth creationist Christian to atheist? That's a good question. So um, when I when it occurred to me that uh, common descent was true. That was when I had my bit of a crisis that what happens to original sin? Mm. And I didn't reject it at all. But, but I was like trying to reconcile in my head, how in the world do I reconcile um, original sin? And I read books like by Peter Enns and other books. But I decided, you know what? Um, I was wrong about young earth creationism because I had my conclusion first. Mm. So what I did was I'm saying, I'm going to stop believing and this was one of the hardest things i ever did i'm going to stop concluding that the bible was true and start from scratch and and go to it and say okay can i build a case without my conclusion first um so the young earth creationism didn't cause my atheism what what, what it did make me do was start from scratch from my bible learning and i and what could i have confidence in and i like could, could i know who wrote the gospel but could i know the pentateuch was written by moses i know any of that stuff um and so i don't know is that an answer um a little bit but my internet was actually cutting in and out so I, but i did hear um practically all of it okay. so that's good, actually like because i think it's actually a good idea to start from scratch first and work your way up because when it comes to like people being raised in a Christian household or something like that, like for me, I wasn't raised in a Christian household. And so I think it's good that to set that foundation, like what does this mean to me, irregardless of what everybody else says? You know what I mean? So I applaud you for that. So that's, but yeah, that hey, answered it. Hey, hey guys, let's try this. We'll, we'll go back and forth, ask each other questions and let's internally have a one minute clock to answer. And I, cause I, I like this, I like this back and forth. So Cam, why don't you ask, Hunter, a question. Hunter, you answer for a minute. Then you choose any one of us three, ask a question. We'll go back and forth like this. But let's keep our answers really short. Cool. I'll try. <laughs> so, Hunter, 
in your um study of like new testament criticism what would you say has been the arguments from uh critical scholars that have posed you um the most trouble to your faith hmm. oh it's always these the, yeah, i noticed y'all answered this the same kind of question y'all asked mike too that he said that it's those psychological ones but that's okay i'm not i didn't think like that the hardest one, I think, when it comes to, like, the idea of the Bible kind of, like, being the inspired word of God, right? Yet, when you go through textual criticism, you see the variants. You see these um, books that possibly wasn't written by the people it was possibly written to. And so, when I actually looked at the textual criticism of the New Testament just alone, I wondered, you know it like how not necessarily like can i find a loophole through this all but what really could i do to try to make sense of this if these are the people of god right and so with that i realized that a lot of when it comes to a lot of christians today the whole reason they believe in, oh, okay, it's kind of like there's two there's two ways of putting this. Sorry, I know it's going a well. Either do you believe in Jesus because of the Bible, or do you believe in the Bible because of Jesus, right? And the Bible is 66 books all compiled together before you know they were compiled, and now you got a Bible. So pretty much, long story short, um, I realized that historically speaking, with Christ, I put as a historical person, if my faith is in Him. And he was who he says he was, and which I've seen the resurrection to show to be true. When it comes to the beginning of the Christian faith, according to all the other alternatives, that's where my faith actually rose up versus like, oh, there's these things in the Bible that people struggle with. So therefore, it's not the word of God. Well, I think it's still very historically reliable uh, for the person of Christ to show how Christianity began. So that's my answer. I know that was long. Sorry, Doug. <laughs> okay, you can ask the question of one of us three. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to take a turn for things. This is to anybody who's a part of it, but tell me about street epistemology. I would love to know more about it. I can answer that in one minute. Street epistemology okay. is, is a method to, of, of having better conversations. It's a, actually a, an interview to critically examine one's deeply held beliefs. It can be about anything, as long as it's usually typically deeply held. Um, and it gets to the root of why they believe, what would change their mind, what markers uh, that they have in their life that would shift them one way or the another. That's about it. That's that's fake news. <laughs> so, <laughs> Oh, if you want... If you street, street epistemology is a manual for creating atheists, also known oh. as the best methodology for sending people to hell. Yes, it's a, it's a method to send people Great. to hell. Okay, um, my, yeah, my, my kidding, are better. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, I'm gonna okay, I'm gonna give you uh, I don't know three or four things. You tell me if um, this would change your mind about the resurrection at all. The, sorry, if this would lower your confidence or raise it. The lower your confidence on the resurrection. If it were true okay. that all the Gospels were written after 70 AD, if that was a fact, would that lower your confidence in the resurrection? No. If it were true that half of Paul's uh, letters were forgeries, would that lower your confidence in the resurrection? No. Okay. Um, if it were true that Paul, Paul's uh, experience of Jesus on the Damascus Road was indeed a vision and not a face-to-face -face bodily thing would that lower your confidence in the resurrection no okay i'm done so you can you okay. can ask you can ask a question i can ask three questions no i'm just kidding um <laughs> yeah sorry um, that was three right but it was yes or no so it was quick no that's okay i liked them they were pretty cool um hmm okay here's one um and this is generally for anybody who wants to answer what, what oh Actually, like, can I do that little thing? Sure. Uh, did you just do it, Doug? Sure. Okay. Um, you like it, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I do, actually. I, I think I might steal that from you. Uh, if the Bible, I'm sorry, if the New Testament was shown to be historically reliable, would you become a Christian? That's for anybody. All yes. three of y'all. 
I would. Yeah. Um, Did you say yeah? It depends what you mean by Christian. I don't hate, hate to waver on that. Um, First Corinthians 15, like Pauline Lan. Yeah, I would do whatever I need to do to not go to hell. Yeah, but the way I'm interpreting your question inside my brain is, if if Christianity is true, would you believe it? And if that's what you really mean, then I'd say yes. Yes or no right. answer, Doug. <laughs> I said yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, uh, Paul, it's your turn to ask. Oh, no, sorry. Did you want to do... Th- you, if you're you gonna, rapid fire. If, if you're going to do rapid fire, it has to be more like yes or no. So, yeah, that's yes, yes, I, yes. I, I thought it was pretty simple, but it is what it is, you know. Well, there's just but, so many different know, types of Christianity. Like, there's, you know... Yeah. Well, yeah, okay. But yeah, that's the only one I needed, so it's all good. <laughs> um, Hunter, do you think that people, and I'm this is two questions, two, two questions. Do you think people choose their own beliefs? Ooh, good question. Hmm. Yes and no. Can you give me an example of a time when you've chosen to believe something that you weren't convinced of? I was chosen to believe something I wasn't convinced of. Hmm. Chosen, oh, wait. Chosen to believe someone wasn't convinced of? That's what you said? Yeah. Um, hmm. Me personally, I can't think of one off the top of my head right now. I'm not that quick of a thinker. But I can think of generally an idea that was where you have people who were raised in a Christian home, so therefore they're Christian. I know that falls in. But, okay. so, but do you think they were unconvinced? Unconvinced? Yeah. Sorry. Say that again. I'm sorry. So I get, my question was, name something that you – or that anyone could could believe that they're not convinced of. Could believe that they're not convinced of. Hmm. I'm just trying to like this, All right. put that and in then, my brain and put it in a way that I can understand it better. Ask yourself, um, if we can't, if we cannot choose to believe something we're not convinced of, and I have not been convinced that Jesus is real or raised from the dead. Um, is it fair that I'm condemned for such a thing? Oh, thinking. okay. I see where you're going with this. I see where you're going with this. Um, hmm. You know, I don't know. To be to be completely fair and honest, I don't know. Okay. Because that's fair. Yeah, yeah. I just leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Uh, your turn to ask. Uh. Who is the craziest person you've had on this panel? <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> um, Rob I can answer that. Rowe. Doug. <laughs> no, no, not at all. No way. It, if I was, oh, yeah. to, no if I was to say, I, it would definitely be that flat earth guy who didn't understand inertia. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, the guy, uh, the, guy, the guy who thought that um, when you throw something up and up, when you're on a train, that it would go backwards. Yeah, I've read of those as well. Not too much of a fan. Just saying. Uh, okay. Uh, y'all sir. Cam, ask uh, Hunter a question. Um, who's your your favorite um, New Testament scholar? Ooh. Mm, Daryl Bach. I like him a lot. He's not that far from me either. Um, I'm actually... Considering getting a New Testament, my master's in New Testament, and hit the school that he actually professes at, um, considering. But it's just, that's up for grabs. I still got one more year left to school, so. But yeah, uh, Daryl Bach, I like him a lot. And you have all the others as well. I like them too. <laughs> uh, is that it? Yeah, you're trying to ask a question. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, oh, oh, okay. Because you, you brought him up. What did you think of Robert when he said that Jesus Christ was born on 9 11 3 BC? Honest. I don't even remember that. That was uh, that happened a few years back, and I kid you not, he got booted off. <laughs> oh yes. I, I, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I that yeah. What did I think? I think was, I thought he was nuts. Why? Um. I don't. Re- this was two years ago, I think. 
something like that. Yeah. But what, but from what, from what, what I read? recall, in like I think I read a Facebook post, and uh, to be perfectly honest, I didn't engage in it like really deeply. But I remember that it was like this really long chain of reasoning, and there were many premises that would need to be in true would need to be true in order for his conclusion to be right. And I become so. Are you aware of that phenomena where when you add on additional parts to your explanation, like it decreases the overall likelihood of your your explanation being true? Are you it's aware almost, of that phenomena? It's almost are you talking about like with me or just like in general? Yeah, just in general. Like when you give an explanation for something, when it has like lots of independent pieces, the collective uh, assessment of it all being true goes down. And so what I was worried about with his chain of reasoning was that it was so extended that it, it made the conclusion like a lot less sound than he thought it was. Hmm. Okay. okay. But, um, I, but to be fair, I didn't dig into it really seriously. So, so it could be totally valid. Okay. Um, my turn. If I told you a story about a guy who worked at a newspaper, who works, wears glasses, had a girlfriend, would you doubt that claim? Um, I mean, I would just have to take your word for it. I wouldn't have, I'd be agnostic on it, to be honest. I wouldn't know. <laughs> but would you have any reasons to think that that claim may not be true? A guy, there's a guy who works at a newspaper, has glasses, has a girlfriend. I mean, it's... Now, what, I mean, if I, yeah, I what, no reason, what if I, I have no you, reason to believe so? <laughs> would, now, would your perception or would your answer change if I told you this man's name was Clark Kent and he could burn um, steel with his eyes? Uh, <laughs> um, unless he was in like a costume or something and you were just playing a joke on me or if like something. No, it's a serious claim. Of- it's a serious claim. I claim that there's a guy who has a job, works at a newspaper company, wears glasses, has a girlfriend. It's a serious claim. Would you believe? Mm. Would, would you believe that? Would you tend to be more likely to believe it or not? And then I tell you that this guy's name is Clark Kent, and he can actually fly around the world and burn steel with his eyes. You alone? No. Okay. Uh, you're trying to ask a question. Hmm. Well, actually, can I expound on that? Why I say no? Uh, sure. Okay, because it's coming from, like. In the debate, talking about the resurrection, because I noticed, you know, what you did there, and it was actually, like it's it. a good. You like question. it, don't you? You like it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great question, and because you would have to then question, like, you know, these uh, people who are saying the things about the resurrection, right? And so with that, it's like, hmm, did he really see that? Uh, most maybe not, because that stuff doesn't normally happen, right? But then, if you know, we actually did know of a person who could do these kind of things um, and actually shown to it, you know, it's been recorded. Uh, people are saying it all around town. It's the top news, everything like that. And all of a sudden, you know, you have multiple people claiming the same thing. Well, then I'll be like, why am I the only one out in this general area that supposedly everybody's at least close enough to at least like all the peasants and everything is seeing the same thing. Cause when you think about it, you have like, you know, the feeding the 5,000, you have, um, these things happening, and then the same guy who's claiming these things. Yeah, I know. I know your thoughts on that. <laughs> and uh, claiming to feed the five thousand. Do you know what's going through have, my head right now? I I feel like I have an idea. <laughs> like, what do you? No, I'm curious. What's your prediction? What's going in my head right now? Paul and his saying on it. Is that what it is? This Paul or Apostle not Paul? Paul? Not Paul. Gina, Apostle Paul. Sorry. Um, No, what's going through my head is like, it's exactly like this Superman and Clark Kent analogy. It's, it's, Mm -hmm. you can believe in the Jesus that walked the earth, that preached to other people who was charismatic and so forth. But if it's right next to a claim that he fed 5,000 with a few loaves and fishes, just like you would, you, you changed your mind, Hunter. You went from, yeah, more likely to believe a guy with glasses that works at a newspaper company. Yeah, but likely to believe that. But as soon mm-hmm. as I put that right next to the yep. fact that he can burn steel with his eyes, you start to question whether if Clark Kent actually even has glasses 
or has a girlfriend is even real yeah right yeah and right so now you mentioned the five thousand, uh you know feeding like yeah. why do you think there's this i'm just gonna say double standard why do you think that it's easy to see with superman and clark kent but so hard to see with jesus and the christ because i in a historical sense at least there's more things that point to other events that surround this figure um, that attest to what he's capable of doing. So, for instance, if going if there is this huge trend going around the news media and everything that this person is doing these crazy things that not a normal person can do um, and people are validating it left and right. Uh, and I go for myself to go check it out. Well, if I see it for myself, then I'm unless I'm hallucinating or unless I'm deceiving myself or if I'm just going crazy, then I would have to find out, you know, for one, is what I'm seeing actually true or two, um, is this all just a load of baloney? But I have to see what everybody else is saying, why this is going on, see it for myself kind of thing, if I'm able to. And if I was able to and it changed my life so much and I wrote it down, then I would try to, uh, I will let people take it as it is. They don't have to believe me, um, but it's kind of the same thing. You know, if it's actually happening, like we know the story of Superman, right? But with this idea of Jesus and everything, it's not written as a um, legend idea. It's written down as if this person actually existed and he historically did these things. So have my thing read is, Mark? Right? Have you read Mark? Yes, I've read Mark. <laughs> can you can but, you imagine reading Mark without knowing anything else? Not reading the other Gospels, not reading the epistles. Just this is a, a challenge for you. In fact, if you yeah. respect me at all, take this as a challenge, a favor, to try to block out all the other Gospels, block out all the other epistles, and just read Mark from chapter one to the end. Mm -hmm. And then, as a truth seeker, ask yourself: Does this read more like a story or more like a historical narrative? And get back to me what you what you think. Okay, I'll do that just for you. Thanks. But also, just a reminder, it does like begin with calling him the son of God. <laughs> <laughs> but here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing that, um, again, this has to do with the presupposition. I presuppose that a God exists. So therefore, these miracles and resurrections are possible. Right. And that's that that that's OK if you have that at hand. But if there is no God and we can somehow make an argument to show why the Christian God doesn't exist, <coughs> which I've actually gone through, <coughs> excuse me, or at least the ones that I did go through, I haven't gone through all of them, I don't think, then that would only be, that would be the kind of factor at play, right, versus the one or the other. So since there is a God, and these things are possible, but without a God, it's not possible. So we just have to... I feel like Paul's, so, Paul's turn yeah. to ask a question. Okay. I changed my question just now. Me so <laughs> you just complimented me on going through the Bible without presuppositions. You just complimented me on that. Mm -hmm. So why would you take this challenge of reading Mark carrying a presupposition? Would you not compliment yourself for accepting the challenge presupposition free? Yes. And no, at the same time, because in the line of chain that I kind of go by is, for one, is there a God or is there not a God? If there's not, then their their naturalism is the way to go, right? Or not just that. I know that kind of came off a little weird, but it would like some things just aren't possible, correct? Now, if there is a God in play, then there's things that are more possible, I guess you could say. So is there a God? Start with that. And then if there is a God, does he connect with us? Is he personal? Does he um, communicate somehow in a sense uh, through, you know, prophets and letter or letters, prophets or what they write down, everything like that. So you have a cumulative so, case, you have a cumulative case for deism, then you have a cumulative case for theism. Does that summarize your position? It, Right. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. And then working your way into if he did, which one, and then uh, pretty much going with which one is the um, most consistent with what is, again, at the table, pretty much, with what we know. Um, and I honestly believe Christianity, for me, 
uh, I don't know, again, I can't speak for everybody, um, is has been shown to be very consistent and reliable. So that's how I came to it. It's kind of like a step-by-step -step kind of thing. So I start with the idea of God. So that's, and then I work my way towards everything else, pretty much. You complimented me for not having a presupposition. So I don't understand why it's good for me not to have one and good for you to have one. Because you started at scratch. So you started from the bottom and you worked your way up. Starting with the concept of God is me starting at scratch and working my way up, pretty much. I'm going to steal man him, Paul. What he's saying is that that his presupposition is more core than yours. Like, So he's, <laughs> he's starting at a, a more base level than... Your presupp the presupposition against miracles uh, in the New Testament is more of a um, fluffy, secondary, tertiary type presupposition, but he's talking about a core. Is that right, Hunter? Is that what you're saying? I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll get, generally give it that. Maybe, so, maybe not more core, but it's, a, it's just how I start off with. Uh, and then I'll work with, um, with that. So how would you respond to somebody who um, agrees with you that a god exists and that the god has the capacity to intervene in the world and produce a miracle how would you respond to such a person if they still weren't convinced by the new testament's resurrection claims um so the idea is that they hold believe in miracles but not the resurrection is that what you just said or yeah, so they like they're convinced that a god exists and that the god has the capacity to raise somebody from the dead. Okay. Um, so I think the part that I struggle with is I don't see I don't quite see the connection. Like I can I'm a naturalist, okay. but yet I consider miracles to be totally possible in the exact same manner in which I consider it possible that I'm wrong about naturalism. Mm. So when i'm looking at a text i'm not assuming that it can't be right because it has a miracle claim because that's not the way that my metaphysics works mm. um so what i'm wondering is like could somebody have a good reason for doubting a miracle claim even if they believe in god um hmm. i think we would just hmm. So because, I'll ask again. I'll ask again, just so it's really yeah, crystal and clear. Could, also, some, could I'll, I'll somebody have a good second to answer the question? So sorry if I take could, too much time. Could somebody have a good reason for not believing a miracle claim, even if they believe in a god that can produce miracles? In a sense, I think anybody can convince themselves of anything. Honestly, um, you just have to. I think if you were to be honest with yourself, you would, um, instead of just outrightly disclaim anything, find out um, what the argument is, what the alternative is to the argument, and then go from there. And I think um, as we constantly, as human people go on in life and everything, um, I remember an old person once told me, once you stop learning, you pretty much stop living. And so I think it's an ongoing process of us constantly moving towards that goal of trying to seek and find what the truth is. And and I think it's just, you know, we just all got to work together and not be so down each other's throats about this stuff as some people are. So that's just me. Hey, a quick announcement. Read up. Uh, uh, Rob Rowe just tried to come in. Rob, if you're listening, um, I half an hour ago, I said we're going to shoot for two hours. I put it in the chat. And uh, we're almost there, and this room only holds four. You always do this to me. You always come in at the very end. Um, so did you have any other questions for us? Um, oh, Brother John in the chat said that there was three. You said earlier that there was three things that new things about the resurrection that you thought we might not know or something. Do you know what he's talking about? Mm, no, I, I, I think what I said was there may be some things that um, – Y'all could be missing versus me. There would be it could be something I'm missing. I try to be fair, you know. So, but I don't think there was three things. I think it was just kind of generally saying something. What's your take on hell? Oh, I knew this was coming. Um, I believe in it. Uh, and the way I is it painful? Uh, uh is it eternal? Yes. yes. Okay. Now that I now you're ready for this. Yeah, here we go. I knew this was coming. <laughs> Would you agree that if Jesus, do you, first of all, are you a Trinitarian? 
Yes. Would you agree that if you're if you worship Jesus as God and you're wrong about that, that you're an adulterer? If you wait, sorry, I went, it kind of cut off there a little bit. Say that just one more time. If you worship Jesus as God, and if Jesus isn't God, would you agree that you are an idolater? You're breaking the first commandment. Mm. Um, it's mm. almost a rhetorical question. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's kind of like a, it's kind of more into it than just a yes or no as well. Why? If Jesus is uh, not God, if he's not a part of the Trinity, if he's, if he's not God, and you worship him yeah. as God, as part of the Trinity, mm -hmm. are you not worshiping something other than God? Oh, um, well, I mean, if he's not God, then yes. Um, well, let me kind of, because I remember this got brought up. You were, I forgot who you're having this discussion with. Uh, the idea of hell and not believing right um if you don't believe you go to hell right is that that i remember you saying that before i don't want a straw man or anything do you hold to that if you don't believe you go to hell do you think that's what the bible teaches uh no okay so what do you think it teaches on um not believing and going I, to hell i think salvation thing? i think even there's scripture that says that salvation is a mystery um uh, i think the calvinists are actually the most consistent Really? So, yep. I believe the Calvinists, are the, as a non-Christian atheist, I think the Calvinists have the most uh, consistent position. And the answer to the question is, who goes to heaven? Who goes to hell? The correct answer is whoever God wants. Because <laughs> mm. then you can okay. avoid the baby problem, the people who live in Africa problem, the Jewish problem before Jesus came. It's just simple. But, but the point of what I was getting to was, you admitted to me, I think just now, that if Jesus is not God, not part of the Trinity, that you are an idolater, correct? You are worshiping something, that, a person who's not God. Would you agree with yeah, that? Yeah, uh, you would be worshiping a created uh, being. Does that, so that would be idolatry. So here's the million dollar question. Are you ever worried about that? Are you ever worried that you may be in worse shape than Paul, Cam, and myself? If Yahweh's real and hell is real, are you ever worried that you actually might be in worse shape than us because you are purposely worshiping a god that isn't god uh yeah i mean i worry about that all the time i question myself all the time seriously you do worry ab about that you might spend eternity in hell yeah yep yeah, because i've not always been a christian so i've always questioned myself i've always tried to use well like first thessalonians five twenty one says test all things and hold to that which is good so me i take that to heart and literally in every, well, maybe not everything. I kind of catch myself sometimes when I don't. But I try my best to honestly test things out, see if it holds up, and then come to the conclusion based on what it is. Okay, that's great. Like there's um, the Jews, the Orthodox Jews have a different concept of hell, but they do believe in it. Some say 11 months or whatever. <laughs> um, it's kind of funny. Yeah. But there's Orthodox Jews who are applauding <laughs> you right now. There's, I know there's at least one or two who watch my channel regularly. And they're saying yeah. there's hope for Hunter. Just like you say, <laughs> I, just like you might say to Paul or Cam or myself, there's hope for us, you know, if we if we're truth seekers. There's Jews looking at you right now and say, there's hope for Hunter that he might come to worship the true God, Yahweh, not this Jesus character who you worship. You are doing in their in their minds, they're viewing you as way worse than us. Like, do you realize that? Yeah, but the thing is, is like it's not it's not like a sense of fear. Because I know I'm also watching the chat box as well. Just saying, um, and people wonder, it's like, man, that's that's pretty hard. Because that's actually been brought to me before. It's like, man, you're just constantly worrying about stuff. Well, and I mean, honesty, I think we all should kind of worry about the stuff, whether it's real or not real. Because, um, like, at the end of the day, we could be wrong. And honestly, when it comes to it, we don't want to be wrong. I mean, who likes to be wrong? Not really anybody. So. Well, I'm not worried about hell. I'm sorry to say, like, I'm really not. There's nothing in me that I true. I'm to the phase now. That's all out of my system. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to convert me to Christianity, I think you almost have to convince me of hell first before of Jesus's resurrection. Why is that? Well, well, let me ask you this. Do you think there's any need for Jesus if there's no hell? Mm. 
Yeah. How so? I do. God's love. No, I'm talking about Jesus, not God. I know. God's love. For God so loved the world, he gave us his only begotten son. So because of God, um, sending Jesus down to die for the cross of us shows us that if Jesus is God, right, that he loves us so much he would die to pay for. Okay, what if I told you uh, I, I have no desire to go to heaven either? Uh, then I don't know where you would go. But the, at the same thing, um, my thing is like Jesus, um, not just to pay for our sins kind of thing, but also to show exactly how much um, God does care about us. Uh, for the sake of so him what? literally coming to himself and dying for us. But there's, like, no, of, there's, like, no, there's no hell in this thought experiment. My question is, why do I need Jesus? Um, If, I mean... Will I make more money? Will I get sick less? Will, um, I, will I be able to love I mean, better? I, no, I just... I think there is more things to it than just being paid for the sins when it comes to the person of Christ. Uh, why you need him... Um, I mean, this is just me, again, just speaking as a Christian, but um, I take him as, you know, a good role model, um, if not the best, um, to live in a, a nice, I don't know, kind of life. Kind of I, thing. Have, I don't know. I'm just, I, I'm, have, I'm, I have Paula Gia. Sure I have Paula Gia, I know, and I have Cam as role models. Role models. Sunday now. <laughs> I'm just really, probably kind of more like a Sunday school teacher than anything, but I try to stay away from that. <laughs> so do you, you think I need Jesus for a role model? Um. No, but my thing is that um, – because the, the original question was um, what else could Jesus um, be for if you know if there is no hell, right? Right, right. that's and the I question. Kind of, yeah, that was the question. So my thing is, for one, you would um, know God's love, um, and two, you could actually um, see the importance of just how – just the kind of things God can do in a sense from um, – Sorry, I got a little sidetracked due to the chat. Um, but you can see actually like the kind of things like if God was actually come down, the only way it's even possible is through the person of Christ. But if there's no hell, isn't God kind of just the jerk who murdered his son for no reason? Um, no, because in a Christian worldview, Jesus is God. So he actually came down because he loved us. He murdered himself. He tortured himself for three days to... For, like, how does that show me love? Like, if, if I wanted to show love to my children and I just tortured myself for three days. Mm. It's more like, would you die for your children? Of course. But I, I would I would sit them down and have a conversation with them first. Well, he did for three years. <laughs> well, not to me. <laughs> well, not, <laughs> not, in any, not in any way that it seems trustworthy to somebody who's studied historical I, methods. I, I want to explore this a little further because these are very common sense questions that I don't hear asked very often of Christians. Why, yeah. do, I, why do I need God's love? Oh, um, hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, in a sense of why do you need God's love? Well, with hell being out of the out of the picture kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, it's almost in a sense like hmm, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to think this one through. I don't like to just bust this, out. This, this is why I ask these questions because these are questions that Christians take for granted. But if you really think about them, like, do I need God's love because I'll be a better husband, a better father? No, uh, like, there's a whole like moral argument kind of thing behind that, but that's a totally different. Do you thing. think I'll be more moral uh, if I have God's love? No, I think um, morals are objective. Uh, I, th I believe in objective morals, so I think they kind of go beyond um, how. Okay, we so, are. so far I have no, I have heard no reason why I need Jesus if there's no hell, and why I even need God's love if there's no hell. Uh, why is sin bad if there's no hell? Um, because you're well. Before we actually get too deep into that, there also is something else I wanted to add to it that I, I don't know why I didn't even think about this. Uh, but a sense of uh, another reason why you and E. Christ and everything is a sense of when by – because you talked about how you didn't want to go to heaven, right? You don't care either way or kind of thing. My thing is like you have a an opportunity to share literally the type of glory that – Almost, it's like Christ is in heaven. 
So you have this opportunity. It, it's a it's a thing called like theosis, um, where you actually um, are glorified as um, in a sense of like you're immense. But the, people on LSD can have that experience. Like, why do I need God for that? LSD. Are you talking about the drugs? Like the acid and all? Yeah. yeah. Or sh mushrooms. You talk to people with mushrooms. They have these amazing existential type experiences. Why do I need God if there's no hell? Why do I need his love if there's no hell? Why is sin bad if there's no hell? Why do I need Jesus if there's no hell? Hmm. There's a correct Ultimately, answer. I, you want the correct answer? This is the answer I think, I you, like, well, this is the answer I think okay. you should give as a Christian. Even within this hypothetical. Because you have a greater likelihood of miracles happening in your life. Hmm. Can you expound on that more? Yeah. So let's say I get diagnosed with stage four lung cancer tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, you could say, Doug, well, you need Jesus because he could cure that for you. Now, if you're a cessationalist, you probably can't say that. But um, I think that would be a good pragmatic reason. I'd say, yeah, you're right. If there's, you know, if I'm dying and there's hope that Jesus could heal me, I need Jesus for that then. So hmm. my, my advice, if you ever ask these questions again, go straight to that. Because you already admitted you yeah. don't need God to be moral. You don't need his love to be moral, to be a better father, to be a better um, spouse. You admitted you don't need it to, um, to really for anything other than maybe some miracles. Yeah. You guys have anything to add? Or should I just play the music? No, I mean, that was pretty good. I don't even know why I think of that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, guys. Well, these are good questions, though. I appreciate them a lot. Well, you know, I got in huge trouble. Um, let me stop the music for a second. <laughs> I got <laughs> those to it. <laughs> those questions I just asked you, Hunter. My wife is a is a evangelical conservative Christian. I asked those same hmm. questions to my wife. Big mistake. No. Um, I'm. I'm curious. Maybe after you. The live stream or anything, you can tell me more about that. Because she was, to be frank, she answered or not answered just like you did. It's like, whoa, why do you need God's love? Why do you need Jesus? <coughs> like, seriously, like, I don't need to pay my, I don't need a God to help pay my electric bill. Now, there's some people in other countries who are in bad shape. They need these miracles, right? They need this hope. I understand that. But the music's already playing, so... What I'm going to do is... Stay on stay on here, Hunter. Don't go anywhere. But what I'm going to do is... We take us all off the screen. And, um, and then we pretend like we're off air. And we say what we really think about each other. <laughs> Were you nervous coming on here? Um, no, not really. Um, I thought it was going to be a nice, because when I watch your videos before, I mean, it's always a good, nice, you know, friendly conversation, so, and I knew, um, I mean, yeah, just now, I didn't really feel nervous at all, it's just I thought it was going to be a good, nice conversation, which it was, so, I loved it a lot. Okay. Any last thoughts, Paul? What did you think of Cam? This is the first time you talked to Cam, right? I've always on Cam, but I've respected Cam for a long time because I watch every one of your videos because I'm a sucker. <laughs> <laughs> I respect you a lot too, Paul, and I really love what you're doing on the Apologia channel. That's Which not what you one? told me, Cam. <laughs> <laughs> I to well, I'm actually hoping, I'm secretly hoping that I can uh, use you two as part of my peer review team, not you, Hunter. But I'm doing, I'm starting to get into a lot more Bible and theology stuff, and I'd love to have a peer review team to back me up on some scripts. Let me send you some. Yeah, I'm available. Cool. Wow, uh, I'm heartbroken. <laughs> Thanks to everyone who showed up in uh, live stream. Thanks so much uh, if there's, for the donations and so forth, and we'll see you next time. Well, bye.